radial uh, maneuvering, as I said. I will just, on the first few slides, I will describe uh, just briefly general uh, catheter shapes, uh, you know, especially for the first, uh, first years. So I want to describe the basic Judkins and Amplatz catheter designs. Those are catheters that are more commonly used from femoral than radial, but they are the most basic catheters. So you need to know them well and understand the nomenclature. So uh, Jut I'll start with Judkins left. So this is the shape of it. It has two curves, first and second curve. The important thing you hear us say JL345, it's the distance between the first and the second curve. It's what we call the arm of the catheter. That's the length of this arm in centimeter is what defines JL345. So JL4 is four centimeter, JL5 is five centimeters. This is an example of a JL4. Look how it's falling. This is a dilated aorta and the JL4 is falling from below. This is a case where you need to step up the arm. You need to increase the size of that arm so it doesn't fall beneath the um, left main and so you engage it in a more coaxial fashion as in this case here. Um, it used to be taught, and it still is true, that you want to engage coaxially. This is particularly true in intervention where you need support, but even in diagnostic procedures, because when you engage this way, one, you lose a lot of contrast, so you get uh, lesser quality images, and two, you can injure the left main. Unfortunately, uh, in the radial era, this is sometimes the only way you can engage is to go from below and I will be talking about it later. So that has become more acceptable in our era, uh, but just uh, keep in mind, if you can, especially from a femoral axis, try to get a more coaxial catheter and you adjust the length of your arm accordingly. This is the Judkins right. Uh, this is meant to engage the right coronary. We overwhelmingly use a Judkins right four. With a Judkins left, we sometimes used four or five, but with a Judkins right, it's overwhelmingly Judkins right four. It's the same thing. It's the size of this arm that defines four versus five. I want to describe Amplet's left, which is a difficult catheter for uh, general fellows but you need to be aware of it. It's very useful for interventions and it's useful in tough to engage coronary arteries, including anomalous coronaries. So the amplats left, it is an amplats left, but it can be used to engage the right coronary as well in some cases, including uh, difficult cases and difficult uh, interventions. So amplats left has this duck shape Let's say amplats left one. Amplats left one, the one is corresponds to one centimeter between this band and this band. This is the one centimeter, okay? So you can imagine amplats left two, amplats left three. What's the difference between them? It's the difference in the length of that arm. Uh, amplats left has a, the, what's characteristic of it. Again, it's a duck shape and it has a very wide uh, secondary curve, okay? This is regardless of one, two, or three. That secondary curve is the same in all of them. It's a big secondary curve. Um, and, you know, it's kind of the butt of that catheter. It's a really, a really big curve. That is meant, that curve, to provide support by sitting over the aortic valve cusps, as well as by abutting the uh, opposite aortic wall. So it's meant to provide a lot of support. And that's why, again, we use it in difficult interventions. Uh, again, m plus F can be used for the right coronary. Usually for the right coronary, it will be a shorter tip m plus left, like 0.75 or one uh, centimeter versus the left coronary, we use m plus left two, typically. Um, now, another characteristic of amplas left is that most often, because of its size, it tends to point upward, 
not always, but it typically tends to point upward, especially in a small aorta. Now I want to talk about amplatz right because it's also a catheter that we use commonly. Amplatz right is only used to engage the right coronary. The difference between amplatz right and amplatz left, let's take for example, amplatz right one versus amplatz left one. The difference is the size of the secondary curve or the size of this butt basically. So this is the secondary curve here. It's much smaller in an amplatz right in such a way that it does not sit on the aortic valve. Uh, I don't have a picture, but it doesn't sit on the aortic valve. It will be basically a catheter that comes like this, doesn't sit on the aortic valve. Also because of its small size, it tends to point downward, unlike the amplatz left, which points upward. So amplatz right is not meant to provide extra support, unlike amplatz left. It kind of has the same quality as a Judkins right catheter. You can use it as an alternative to Judkins right in engaging the RCA. It doesn't have major advantages compared to Judkins right. Am uh, Amplatz left is the spe special catheter. Um, be careful with Amplatz left. That's why it's difficult for general uh, fellows. Uh, it's a catheter that when it sits in the coronaries, I'll explain it in some other time. I'll explain how to engage using amplatz left, but be careful when it sits in the coronary, if you try to pull it out, it will dive deeper. It will inherently dive deeper if it's sitting on the valve. You pull out, it dives deeper. So it's difficult to disengage and that's why you can dissect when you use it. So a lot of time you have to push and clock to get out of the coronary before you finally pull it and you have to do it under fluor, watching how that tip behaves. So be careful, disengagement is difficult with amplatz left. Um, amplatz left one is useful in anterior uh, right coronary artery takeoff, and again, in any difficult intervention, right or left. I want to mention this is a very basic view, but I want to make sure everybody understands it, this view. This is an axial cut across the aortic valve. This is uh, anterior and posterior. I just want to make sure this is like the echo view that Mercedes uh, sign, uh, the um, aortic short axis cut. I want everybody to know um, the difference between RAO and LAO view. The reason we always use, we typically use LAO view to engage the native right and left coronary artery. And this view, this uh, uh, image explains why. You want to always pick a view that is orthogonal to the structure you're trying to reach. So it gets splayed out for you, okay? So that you can see where the catheter should point, right or left. So that's why we use LAO, we come from here. Imagine using RAO, then the catheter will be looking at you to engage the right or away from you to, to engage the left but it's hard to gauge how the catheter is looking in a two-dimensional view when you use RAO. That's why you use LAO. And that applies to a lot of other things. You always want to, to in order to uh, maneuver a structure, you like to be orthogonal to it. You like to splay it out. Uh, this is a, another view this time of the, um, this is more of a coronal view maybe in a, of the chest. Again, the LAO opens the aortic arch and it opens the right versus left cusp, okay? Uh, if in an RAO, you will see both the ascending and descending aorta overlap if you come, if you look from here. Those are, you know, important fluoroscopic ideas to understand. Another interesting idea to always uh, recognize, because of the shape of the aorta, the right coronary cusp is lower than the left coronary cusp, okay? And the non-coronary cusp, which is the posterior most cusp, is actually lowest, lower than the other two, okay? So that's another uh, important idea. You know, sometimes you see the catheter jumping from one end to the other. Whenever it dips, that's usually the right coronary cusp or the non-coronary cusp. Whenever you see it dipping, the left cusp is the, is the higher one. The aorta is kind of tilted posteriorly. That's what makes the posterior non-coronary cusp uh, as makes it the lowermost cusp. 
So I just talked about some basic catheter um, shapes. I want to jump to um, radial techniques and how to maneuver using a radial axis. You know, I don't envy fellows uh, currently because it's much harder to train fellows these days compared to uh, 10 or 15 years ago when we used to train uh, primarily using femoral axis, which is easier. Uh, it's much easier maneuvering, I think, to learn. So here is uh, one idea. I guess if, does, if somebody has a question about catheter, basic catheters, uh, I can answer it. Otherwise, I can move to this. I think you can go ahead, Adriana. All right, good. So this is... Um, so this is the, um, just to illustrate to you why it's, why radial is difficult. This is a femoral axis, how we're engaging a left coronary from a femoral axis. This is a right radial axis. So you have two bends. You have a bend here and you have a bend there. The catheter will inherently want to uh, spread out of that ascending aorta, fall out of it straighten out and go into the aortic arch. So basically go into left coronary, it's opposite to the natural tendency of that catheter. That makes you lose some force and some support when you're engaging that coronary um, and makes a maneuvering more difficult. Left radial on the other hand is easier, not as easy as left femoral, but as, as femoral, sorry, but it's easier you do have less resistance and you're not bending the catheter backward opposite to its tendency. Uh, another thing that the right radial does compared to femoral, and I will explain it in a little bit, it tends to straighten that catheter furthermore. Uh, and that's why frequently from a radial axis, we need a shorter arm catheter because it straightens it and elongates it. So we need a, a shorter arm catheter typically, compared to what you would use, compared to the Judkins you would use from a femoral, you would use a shorter Judkins from a right radial, not necessary, necessarily from a left radial. So I will explain to you the basic steps on how to engage from a radial axis, the way I do it at least. So Here's the way I do it. So one, I get the wire all the way into the ascending aorta, all the way over the aortic valve cusps. That's a, and I make it loop over it. That's one. That's not always necessary with um, femoral engagement, but with rare engagement, you have to make the wire loop all the way over the aortic valve. Then you advance the catheter all the way over it to touch the aortic valve cusp. That's again, not necessary with femoral, but it is necessary with radial axis. So after you make it touch uh, the cusp, the idea here is with the right radial is that the catheter will always tend overwhelmingly tend to fall into the right cusp, which is a lower, more, which is a lower cusp. That's the tendency of the uh, catheter to fall from this anatomy. The key idea here is to make it jump from the right to the left cusp. That's a key step in engagement. You have to do it, the, you know, you have to do slight torque to make the catheter look in this direction. And you can do that while the wire is still in place. Then you have to pull and see it jump from right to left cusp. And that's the most important step, I think, in the right radial, to see that jump. And that will allow you to be in the left cusp and subsequently to engage the left main. Those maneuvering are typically performed with the wire still in place. Now you can pull it backward after you get the catheter here. I usually pull the wire backward into the catheter. I place it here, I don't, but I don't take it all the way out. The catheter helps me, prov helps provide me more torquing uh, capacity and it helps provide more, um, um, you know, it's a bailout. I'll explain to you a little later. If the catheter jumps out in the uh, aortic arch, you use the wire to get back down. Remember the tendency of the catheter is to jump out. If you do uh, any mistake, it may jump out. So the wire helps you get back down. So again, loop everything over the wire and try to jump from the right cusp to the left cusp. 
So this is how you go and then you jump from the right to the left cusp. Now, after you jump from the right to the left cusp, how do you engage the left coronary? And I'm focusing on the left coronary now because the left coronary is the more difficult one, in my opinion, from a radial approach. It's the opposite from a femoral approach. The left coronary is very easy. The right coronary is a little harder. So after you get from the right to the left cusp, then you have to engage that left main. And there are two ways of doing it. One is to just pull and hope it will jump in the left main. The other technique is to push from below and make the catheter catch the left main from below. That's what I alluded to a little earlier. I said, you know, in the femoral area, we used to hate that catheter coming from below and pointing up. Unfortunately, in the radial area, we often have to use that. So those are the two possibilities. And depending on the case, you may favor one versus the other. I'll give you examples here. Um, in a patient, uh, let's say, maybe I have it okay here. In a patient who has a short aorta, okay, if you get on the left cusp, if you try to pull up to engage your left coronary, most often that catheter will flip over itself, could fall out, could fall and hug the right side of the aorta, but it will be very difficult to engage it uh, from just by pulling using this technique. So people with a short aorta, and you can see how short fluoroscopically, you can see all your catheters and wire are getting twisted. I'll show you more images. Those patients, in my opinion, I just try to engage going from below, loop it from below. Um, if needed, if I can't loop that catheter from below, I may just bring a catheter with a shorter arm and loop it from below. Okay, like from a tiger to a Jutkins left three, for example, and loop it from below. That's a common situation in women um, or shorter people. Um, so that's one. Take on the other hand, a tall person, a tall person uh, or somebody with long aorta, they tend to do better with this technique and it's easier to engage them with this technique. It may even be harder to engage with this because you may get away from the left main. Another case is if you have a lot of innominate, innominate and uh, aortic tortuosity, also those are cases where you're not able to torque much in order to ensure catheter stability. You also, I think it's better to go from below to ensure catheter stability in those very tortuous cases where it's hard to torque. All right, this is an example of somebody with a short aorta. I mean, you can tell here what I'm talking about, short aorta. You go from the arch to this. Look how stuck, you know, stocky. It's very short here. So here you have to engage. I think in my opinion, this is the only way to engage is to go from below. If you try to get into it from here, the catheter will jump out. You have to go from below and engage it. It's, it's, it looks ugly, the catheter is pointing up, but that's, in my opinion, unfortunately, the only way. Um, okay, here I just wrote down the tips that I just described, just for you to, um, to be able to read them when you review them. Um, another one technique I didn't mention. So I said, we, you know, I keep the wire in, that helps me. Keep in mind, you don't want to keep the wire in for too long. We don't like to keep the wire in for more than two minutes or so in the catheter, it clots. So if you're having problem, you know, two minutes later, you should take out that wire, at least wipe it and put it back if you want to use it again, but don't keep the wire in for too long. Try to keep it though, it helps. Another thing that you can do, especially in those patients is to, as you're trying to engage, is to ask them to take a deep breath. That will elongate that aorta. It will also elongate that innominate aorta junction. It will straighten everything. So it will make it easier to get into the ascending aorta and it will make it easier to get into the cusp and even the left cusp. Those are some, I, I have some video examples just to show you. So this is a catheter here and I want to watch the jump. So this is a tiger catheter, uh, which is a specific right radial catheter. So we went into the right coronary cusp initially and we pulled, watch it again. 
until we jump into the left cusp. That's the key step. And I have the wire in. You can see the opacity of that wire in. That's just a basic image. Uh, that's another uh, case. Uh, oh, is this the same? Okay. Same idea. Here, this is the one. Okay, sorry. This is another case. Here you see the jump. Then we see that I push to engage from below. Okay, that's a standard technique. I'll let you watch it again. So again, you jump from the right to the left cusp, then you push and you engage from below. That's probably one of the most common techniques I use. That technique can be used with a Tiger catheter, the special right radial catheter such as Tiger and Jackie, and it can be used as well with uh, Judkins left catheter. It is also used with guides, specifically the radial guide, uh, Icari left guiding catheter. Um, I think this is a, let me see, sorry. This is another one, I just have a few illustrations here. Again, it's in the right cusp, it jumps in the left cusp. And here I push and it's engaging. That's another case, but it's kind of the same technique. Uh, let me see what this is here. So here we jumped from right to left, but that wasn't enough on the, sorry. On the next case, we jumped from right to left in this video, but you can see on the next slide, this patient has a short aorta or stocky aorta. The catheter was coming beneath the left main. So I, we tried to loop it, we couldn't, but you can imagine why we couldn't. It's a big arm here. I couldn't engage from above. It's hard when they have that aorta. And I couldn't engage from below because that arm was too long for me to engage from below. And whenever we tried to push, it will loop out. It will embrace that shape. I traced it for you. So what I did in this case, I got, we got a shorter arm JL three and a half instead of tiger, which is four centimeter arm. The standard tiger is four centimeters. So I got this, you see here a jump, and I pushed and I was able to engage from below using a shorter arm. Now this looks very ugly, the way it looped and engaged. That's a risky way of doing it. You would want it to be more gentle, but anyway, we did engage it from below and we got good images. Um, all right, uh, let me see what this is. This is another illustration, I think. Again, this is another illustration of how to engage uh, from below. That technique uh, works, uh, you know, better. It works well with diagnostic catheter, but it works even better with uh, some guiding catheter sometimes as well, like the Icari left. This is specifically an Icari left guiding catheter. Now, let's say we engaged the left coronary using all the steps that I highlighted before. The next step is to engage the right coronary. Now, how to engage the right coronary using the tiger, the same tiger or Jackie catheter that you use to engage the left coronary? That's our standard approach. We use. Uh, my approach at least. We, I use Tiger or Jackie, which are the standard right radial catheter, to engage the left, then to engage the right. If I have problem engaging the left, I usually switch to Judkins left 3.5, as I showed in one of the slides, because of the shorter arms arm that allows me to engage the coronary from below in difficult cases. So once you use, let's say, step back, I use Tiger for to engage the left coronary. Uh, how do I make that tiger engage the right coronary? It's also standard maneuvering. Um, so after the, the catheter is here, that's not the best picture for it, sorry, but that's okay. So imagine that catheter here in the left cusp or engage on the left coronary. You have to pull it out of the left coronary slightly. All your maneuvering have to be subtle here. Otherwise things jump out very easily in the radial axis, they jump out into the aortic arch. So you pull gently, you give it a slight torque, whether clock or counterclock, depending on the case, it varies. 
but you give it a torque till that catheter tip looks at you. Then once it looks at you, meaning you've geared it away from the left coronary, you push it all the way back down to the right coronary cusp, which is where it likes to go anyway. You just have to gear it slightly away from the left cusp. So you make it look towards you and you push it all the way down. And after you push it all the way down, you, you know, um, then you start your standard maneuvering for right coronary artery engagement. And at this point is actually easier than femoral. The standard maneuver is to get to the right cusp and clock the catheter with a pull. Keep in mind that the right coronary is low. Most often the right coronary, if I have to guess, it's lower than most fellows think. Most often when they miss the right coronary, it's that they pull the catheter too much from a radial axis, by the way. That's a little different from a femoral. From, from a radial axis, it's often that they miss it. They are already on that convexity. When I give a puff, I see the convexity of the aorta. That means they are already too high. Whenever you puff and see convexity of the aorta here, that means you're already too high. So from radial, you get to the right cusp and you pull slightly with a slight torque, coordinated um, maneuver of tor torque and pull, and you engage the right coronary artery this way. It's kind of the same technique from femoral, except it's uh, significantly harder. You have to pull more from a femoral the catheter tends to dive when you clock it. That's not the case with the radial. It doesn't tend to dive when you clock it. From ephemeral, it dramatically dives. So it's harder to coordinate how much to pull versus how much you torque. But it's easier from radial. Slight pull with a slight torque. And you can use, again, Tiger Jackie or Judkins Right 4 is a very good catheter, or Amplatz Right 1, which is also a good catheter from femoral or radial. So uh, I mentioned the special radial catheter, catheters. I will mention just, I will elaborate a little bit more on the Jutkins catheters from a radial axis. Uh, so this is the, those, this is the shape of those catheter. I mentioned them earlier, but this is how they look. First look at the Jutkins left. I described it uh, earlier um, in this conference. So. This is how the Judkins left 3.5 looks. This is how the Tiger looks. So Tiger has that advantage of having, you know, Judkins left has a point, the secondary bend is a bend. For Tiger, the secondary bend is a plateau, is a segment. So it's more likely to embrace and sit over that aorta, okay? It's a segment, it provides more stability than a point which tends to loop up. Tiger is more stable in that position. Same with Jackie. Tiger versus Jackie. Jackie has an extra bend at the very tip, which allows it to point more downward. Um, and that may be nice sometimes when you engage from below, that extra tip, try to make the catheter more coaxial, even if you're coming from below. This is the Icari left, uh, guiding catheter. It somehow is a little bit similar maybe to Tiger, but it has several, two, two or similar to Judkins left, left. It has those two differences. One, you have again, you have a plateau rather than just a bend. You have a plateau that sits on the aorta. The secondary curve is a plateau. And two, very interestingly, it has a bend in the enominate artery. Uh, so it makes the catheter less likely to jump out because it's already bent. It's meant to embrace that curve, enominate aorta, okay? So uh, if you're using, or here, sorry, before, this is, this is some illustration of the um, differences between uh, Jutkins and the Icari left catheter. This is Jutkins, this is the Icari left catheter. And that here applies also for Tiger. So what curve catheter to use? If, if we're talking about Jutkins, what curve is Jutkins to use from a right radial axis? The, if you're using Jutkins, like I said, because the right radial, um, transradial anatomy tends to elongate the catheter, it's best to use a shorter arm at Jutkins left. 
especially in cases where you fail with a tiger, you typically need a cho shorter arm, a Judkins left. So if you use Judkins left four from a groin, you probably need 3.5 from um, the right radial. Uh, that applies to the left. That doesn't apply to the right. For the right coronary, it's the same, short, uh, same curve, um, Judkins right four. You should not um, lower the, the number, the size of the curve or the size of the arm, sorry. Uh, I think that kind of summarizes. The same thing kind of for guiding catheter. If you're not using ICARI, if you're using the standard uh, CLS XB catheter, you downsize it by a half point, typically. This kind of shows you why the right, you don't need to shorten it because the right tends to be coiled over itself when the catheter is looking toward the right coronary. It's not as elongated as when it's looking toward the left coronary. That's why you don't need to shorten the arm when you're engaging the right coronary. You definitely need to short it with a Judkins catheter when you're engaging the left coronary or the Judkins left coronary catheter. All right. So I think I mentioned here, uh, you know, a lot of um, ideas about how to engage the from a radial axis with Tiger as well as with the Judkins. And I discussed a little bit some of the uh, different catheters. Uh, by the way, from a left radial, you don't need to change the curve sizes for RCA or LCA. Although in my experience, sometimes I do the same thing. I do use a smaller curve for the left coronary artery, but it's less often needed than with the right coronary. Again, because the anatomy kind of mimics the left femoron. Uh, the, the femoron. Uh, another thing, so I mentioned the tiger, Jut, the tiger uh, Jackie, as well as the Judkins catheters and the Icari catheter. There is another uh, catheter that's useful uh, that I mentioned earlier, that is great for fem in femoral um, uh, procedure, as well as in radial procedure. It's good for difficult cases and it works well in difficult radial cases. It's the Amplatz left is a great catheter. Uh, it's good for difficult coronary intervention in both radial or uh, femoral access. Um, and an Amplatz left catheter may be useful in cases where no catheter is providing you good support or good engagement, specifically in a right radial access, okay? Again, the, what works with Amplatz is that it tends to sit on the aortic valve anyway and engage from below. So it works very well with our radial techniques. And it sits on that valve. It has a large secondary curve or the large butt that sits on the aortic valve, less likely to loop and prolapse with good support. This is an example of an Amplatz left. That's how you engage it. Again, this is the big curve as opposed to the Amplatz right. So initially it comes elongated. You make the tip like you do with the tiger or the Icari, you make the tip jump from right to left coronary cusp. Then you push it to make it take that duck shape. Then after you push it, it the tip goes up and you try to hope it will catch the left main. You may have to torque to make it, depending on if you're out of plane, you may have to torque it to catch the left main. Once it catches it, you pull a little bit to make it dive a little bit deeper and be coaxial with the left main. I think this is an illustration of an amplatz. So here I'm, we're pushing against the left cusp. It will look, so you see how it jumped? Again, it's risky maneuvering. The tip is in the left coronary cusp and we're pushing here until it cut the left coronary ostium. I, before I had made a jump from the right cusp to the left cusp, then we pushed it. Uh, again, those are just uh, stuff for you to read if you like. So to summarize, uh, this is for diagnostic procedures. I use uh, Tiger Jackie or Judkins catheter, smaller Judkins catheter. For simple intervention, I use a Judkins or I carry left. For complex left coronary intervention, I use I carry left 
uh, I don't use EBU. I use usually either I carry left or Amplitz left catheter for complex. For simple one, I carry left or Judkins catheter. Now for RCA, uh, it's a Judkins right four. For complex RCA, you can use I carry left, I carry right, or Amplitz again. It's probably a little more useful for interventional fellow. Now, I, I talked about a lot of stuff about uh, radial engagement. I want to mention two other issues related to radial engagement. This time, I focus on the coronary and cusp aspect and catheter aspect of the radial engagement. I want to step back now and focus on some other problems you encounter at the enominate level as well as, as at the radial brachial level. So this is a common problem at the enominate level, those loops and tortuosity. Okay, this is a roller coaster, 360 degree loop. The tighter that loop, the tougher it is to cross. The smaller that loop, the tougher it is to cross with a catheter. And the more calcified, the worse it is. The, the biggest enemy is calcium. To calcified tortuosity is, is, a, is an extremely tough case to cross here. This is more prevalent, that loop, with five, five features make it more prevalent. Older age, severe hypertension, female sex, shorter stature, maybe, maybe less than 5'4 or so. And in my opinion, I realized after moving from Louisiana, probably the biggest one is the uh, black race. Uh, it's, in my experience, it's far more prevalent those loops in African-American patient than in white patients. And I would think it's partly related to the uh, severe hypertension. Um, so uh, that makes it very difficult. Now, how to maneuver through this? In those cases, in order to cross this, one, you use deep breathing to elongate and straighten that curve. Two, uh, you may need a glide wire, which is a slippery a polymer covered hydrophilic wire you may need a glide wire to cross this, okay? Uh, this is seen in up to 10% of patient from a right radial. If, if you cannot cross, you can, and, and what that scarf does, it, it makes you lose torqueability and it makes you lose support. Even when you get here, the catheter is, will be flying, will be unstable. And the moment you start pushing a stent or wire, the catheter will, stand, will uh, fly out. So it makes you lose a lot of support. Uh, left radial, from a left radial axis, it's less prevalent, and that's one advantage of left radial. Instead of 10%, it's probably 5% from a left radial. Uh, or you can go to femoral in those cases if you're not getting enough support or you're not able to get through it. Uh, those are some other examples here of uh, how to cross it. Um, what you do, I don't know if I have a picture of it. No, I don't. So what I do here when I cross, after I cross this loop and I get down, I pull on the catheter and you ask the patient to take a deep breath and that will straighten that tortuosity. Sometimes pulling, after you cross it, you pull on the catheter that straightens that tortuosity. All right, and um, I mentioned um, how I mentioned those things. One issue not necessarily related to this, whenever you have, even without tortuosity, you may have issues where the catheter and the wire keep going the descending aorta. That's somewhat easier to deal with in general. You just ask the patient to take a deep breath and you position your cath, before you ask him to take a deep breath, you position your catheter in the aortic arch in this area, you counter clock it. You make it point in this direction, then you ask the patient to take a deep breath and you push the wire and it goes down. Now, another sort of problem you will encounter aside from the enominate is radial ulnar tortuosity, radial ulnar loop, something like that. Okay, this is a loop uh, around the radial brachial um, junction. And those are other cases, you know, see how that radial here is looping before getting into the brachial. So that's another sort of problem you'll encounter. You may be able to cross it just, you're not going to cross it with a J wire. So whenever you encounter this, try uh, a soft tip 
non-J wire, such as a woolly wire. That's what I try first. It, it may go. Now, if the loop is very tight, that's not going to go. The first thing I advise you to do here is to take a picture with half contrast under what we call uh, cine. Cine images with, uh, I mean, um, subtraction cine image with a roadmap. That will define your anatomy because don't push. If the wire doesn't go, don't push. You will perforate easy here. So take um, a subtraction image, see what you have and try to cross using the subtraction roadmap image. Um, one thing I advise you here, I mentioned using glide wire in the enominate, okay? Do not use a glide wire, absolutely not in my opinion in this area. The glide, there are so many tiny branches and the glide wire is a recipe for disaster. It will dive in any of those branches and it will perforate. So I've had it, unfortunately. Uh, so do not do, don't use a glide wire. Uh, in those cases, just try the Wally wire. And if that doesn't work using roadmap technique, one, you can abort, it's okay. You don't have to kill yourself to do a radial case. Two, you can um, use this technique. Uh, where is it? Here. You can use this technique. Use 014 inch wire. The standard wire for fellows to know, the standard wire, this is an 035 inch wire. The standard wire we use in the, to navigate the aorta and the major arteries. Use an 014 wire, which is the coronary intervention wire, and inflate a balloon, a coronary balloon, at the tip of your catheter, two millimeter balloon for a six French catheter. Two millimeter balloon halfway in the catheter, halfway out. This will serve like a dilator and advance this system, advance the wire and this whole system through the tortuosity. The first thing to do is to advance the wire, make the wire cross the tortuosity. Then you track it with the catheter and the balloon together. Uh, so that's what's called balloon assisted tracking. It's a commonly used technique. Again, don't push, you have a problem just if you can switch to femoral or left radial. Um, another one thing I wanna mention that I've encountered uh, recently, um, I, have, I encountered commonly, it's the anatomic variability of the radial artery. This is how the radial artery is commonly. You have radial artery, you have ulnar and interosseous artery. So radial and ulnar, and they join the brachial artery at the elbow. In a substantial number of patients, up to 7%, you have those two, three, and four. The worst is two. Basically, the radial artery goes all the way and joins the brachial, uh, the axillary artery. It has no connection with the brachial artery. In three and four, the radial artery joins the brachial and it has another branch that we call axillary, uh, that we call accessory radial artery that joins the axillary artery in those two. Now this is, a, those are difficult, why? Because whenever you have this morphology, two, three, and four, the radial artery in the arm becomes very small, typically becomes very small and it's hard to cross. And it's particularly small you know, you know, it can be small in all of them. It, it is more problematic in this case because you have no option of going into a Baker artery. In this case, if you take an image, you encounter difficulty advancing. You take an image, you see this anatomy, you know to gear your uh, devices into the brachial artery, but here you have no choice. You have to go through this. And again, it's typically small in all of them that axillary, that accessory portion of radial artery is typically small and is very hard to cross with devices and you get massive spasm through it. And it's a small, even in big people. I mean, last case I had, it was a colleague in my prior job. He was able to cross it with a little bit of difficulty, but not much. The biggest nightmare is that you cross it, but cannot take the catheter out. And that's the problem he had. He crossed it but he wasn't able to take the catheter out. The catheter was clamped, uh, the artery was clamped over the catheter. We had to do general anesthesia and eventually actually surgical sympathetic block to be able to take the catheter out. So be aware of those anatomy. You may be able to cross it 
uh, especially in three and four, you may be able to uh, redirect your gears, uh, but just be aware of that. Those are present in up to 10% of patients, the combination of those, but the high radial origin cases in up to 7% of patients. So you will encounter it, be aware of it. Um, I think I'll stop here. I think I gave a lot of information, but uh, somebody has a question, uh, please feel free. Uh, we have some time, I think. Dr. Hannah. Yes. Thanks for the presentation. This is Rakesh. Uh, can you uh, show us one more time, if you have already did, uh, yeah. like how to realize whether we are uh, smaller in the size or bigger in size when we cannot engage the left uh, via right radial axis? Uh, like how do we know to size up or size down uh, when using JL? Uh, or traditional, or my traditional ways to do JL35 to begin yes. with a normal person. How, how do I know whether it's too small or too big? Yes, so you have to look at the behavior of the catheter. Most often, I would say from a radial, from a femoral, I showed pictures earlier, how to tell. This is, I'll go quickly. From a femoral, when your catheter falls like this, that means you need a bigger arm catheter. When your whole catheter, the big arm of your catheter is falling like this horizontally, that means you need a bigger arm from a femoral. Now from a radial, as you mentioned, it is more tricky because a lot of time we, we like that. I mean, sometimes that's our only option. So from a radial, it's actually, you see how your catheter behave. So for example, let me show you a picture uh, here, this, this one. This one, it provides an illustration. This catheter, so the tip came below the coronary, a left main. This one is too straight. Even from a femoral axis, you will need to step it down to make the catheter more, point more up. So you need to step it down. Another way of looking at it is how the catheter points. If the catheter points down and away from the left main, you need to size if it's pointing down, that means you need to size down your catheter. If it's pointing up, that means you need to size up your catheter. So if this catheter is too small and it's pointing up, you increase the size of your arm. You make it point down. Okay, so you see how you're pointing down, that means the arm is too big, shorten it. Pointing up, that means the arm is too small, lengthen it. But that's not always perfectly true with radial. Uh, you just have to feel, in this case, imagine, I want to pull it to engage from below. It's clearly too big. I mean, sorry, I want to push it to be able to engage from below. It's clearly too big to be pushed. As you see here, I had to get something small to be able to push it and engage. So we see how your catheter is behaving. If it's looking like it's too tight when you're pushing it, Judkins left four or Tiger, which is four, that means you, you need to step down. You just see how things are tight during your maneuvering. Most often in radial, again, you need to probably step uh, down. On occasions, it, and, you know, it's more in interventions and probably a little more difficult. I've had, let's say I use, I carry left 3.5. I'm trying to loop it from below and it's not even reaching. This is a case where I know I need to get a longer arm to reach, such as I carry left four or 4.5. So, you know, you have to individualize, but the general rule is what I told you. You see how the catheter is looking and then you downsize the arm accordingly. Thanks, Dr. Hanna. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Please feel free to ask. Or any input? I don't know if Dr. Rawson is here, if, if he has any uh, comment or additions. I don't think he has joined. Ah, okay, okay, that's fine. All right, so um, any other uh, question, tips? You need to practice those, that's the key, of course. I have more stuff about catheter tips. Uh, I will go over them um, in the future. There are a lot of other tips I'll go over, you know, techniques, uh, grafts, remember that's important, uh, anomalous coronaries, uh, common anomalies, 
you know, how to maneuver through um, all those things, I will go over them. LV maneuvering, even right heart cath maneuvering. I have, uh, I will talk about those in subsequent sessions. Dr. Hanna? Yes. So, sorry, one last question. When you said to use the balloon for on O14 wire yes. uh, for radial, uh, do you use what kind of balloon do you standardly use for yeah. for your uh, non guide catheters? Two millimeter. So for a six French catheter, even if it's not a guide, it's two millimeter balloon. Two okay. usually two by twenty balloon, and you make half of it hang out. 10 millimeter half uh, out and 10 millimeter in, uh, two by 20 millimeter. For a five French, it's 1.5 millimeters. If you're using a five French tiger, which by the way is a good idea. If you're doing diagnostic, one thing you want to do not to use, don't use six French in those difficult maneuvering cases across the radial brachial um, anatomy, use five French. And in that case, you would use 1.5 by 20 millimeter balloon, standard balloon, of course, not a, a non-compliant, a regular compliance balloon. You advance your wire, you make it loop, then you inflate the balloon and you advance over the loop this. If you can, don't push, it gets hard. Especially again, it's harder when the loop is small. The smaller the loop, the harder it is. Okay, you got it? Yes, thank you. Any other questions, comments? I don't see any. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Adriana. Thank you. Thank you for attending.